Welcome to another podcast of the Apologist Bookshelf. I'm Gary Zacharias. I'm happy that you joined me. I want to cover, uh, for the second time, I want to dip back into a book that I had covered in one of my first 100 podcasts. It's called Relativism, Beckwith and Kokel. And uh, this one definitely deserves a second round, uh, another discussion about it, because when they mentioned relativism, when they wrote this book, it was big, but it's just blossomed. It's gotten bigger and bigger, and it's taking over everything. And uh, the growth of it is just uh, astounding that people have fallen into such relativist ways of thinking. So this book defines what moral relativism is, gives you some examples, it critiques it, talks about how moral relativism has uh, gone into our society and affected things in a terrible way. And then there are some good responses and ways to refute the philosophy. And that's actually what I covered in my previous podcast for this book. So if you want to go dig that one up, take a look. It's uh, one of my first ones, Relativism by Kokel and Beckwith. All right, so I thought maybe this time I would look at, let's see if I can find it here, the first couple of chapters. This one's called The Death of Truth. And it starts with a quotation that really stunned me when I read it by in, in the original book, and then Kokel picked up on it as well. Alan Bloom wrote a critique of American education. The book was called The Closing of the American Mind. That tells you a lot right there, doesn't it? The closing of the American mind. I thought you went to university and all to open your mind. But here's how he starts off. This is Bloom talking. There's one thing a professor can be absolutely certain of. Almost every student entering the university believes or says he believes that truth is relative. Wow. That's so sad, but it's true. And Kokel points out that we're witnessing and we're we're being part of the death of truth. It's a terrible revolution and we're part of it. And that's the idea that we could know any particular thing for sure. True truth. It's gone. People have lost the confidence that you can make a statement of fact that is really fact, and people instead say, no, it's just your opinion. In fact, the word truth now is pretty much true for me, and that's it. And Kokel and Beckwith are going to point out that when truth dies, things that cling tightly to it, like ethics, perish with it. If you can't know truth, then moral truth is incoherent. Ethics become relative, and then right and wrong are just you know, matters of individual opinion. It's just how I feel. The death of truth has created what they call moral decay. And it says, every debate ends with a barroom question now. Says who? Yeah, I, I've seen that. That's so true. Then Kokel takes it a step further. He says, you know, when morality is reduced just to your personal taste, then the moral question that should be out there, what's good, what, what ought we do, what should we do, that's gone. And it's replaced by a pleasure question. What feels good? So not what is good, but what feels good. And so it, it works like this. People assert their desires, and then they try to rationalize their desires with moral language. So he says that's the tail wagging the dog. And when self-interest rules, that's a huge impact on our behavior, especially how we treat other humans. So after all, if human respect and human dignity is going to depend on the existence of moral truth. But if there's no moral truth, why would you sacrifice for anybody else? So you discard people if they become troublesome or expensive, or maybe they cramp our lifestyles. And we've seen that over and over again. So his point, and I say his, Coco wrote this part of the book, if there's no truth, then nothing really has transcendent value. And here, here we go. And that includes human beings. So what are we? Well, if you get rid of morality, we're just creatures. We're just meat. And when we're viewed as things, then we get treated as things. He says the death of morality has also produced kind of an anything goes mentality. People do all sorts of things. The, the boundaries are gone. And so things like sexual habits become more and more distorted. Now he gives the example, a pretty famous example, of Robert Maplethorpe. Uh, apparently a very uh, talented photographer. And he had uh, a set up, it was an art trial, and in the Contemporary Art Center in Cincinnati, 
they had some of the works of Maplethorpe, and here were some of them. A picture of a 10-year-old girl sitting in a chair with her knees up and her genitals were exposed. A photograph of a man who was naked except for cowboy boots. He was bent over with a bullwhip in his anus. And a shot of one man expelling a stream of urine into the mouth of another. So the curator of another museum was asked, is that urination picture, is that art? Yes. Is it fine art? Yes. Why? Because of the composition and the lighting. Wow. And so I like the fact that Kokel has gone to Dennis Prager for a quotation. And Prager is a terrific individual. I hope you've listened to his radio show. I hope you've read some of his material. Uh, seen him on YouTube videos. A uh, terrific person. I love his uh, statements. And here's what Prager had to say. Ladies and gentlemen, if some of the leading artists in a civilization see a man urinating in another man's mouth and see composition and lighting and don't see their civilization as being pissed upon, we are in trouble. And uh, as graphic as that is, that's exactly right. We have institutionalized moral relativism, Coco says. That, that now we're saying, what's the, the goal of life, the supreme goal? Be happy. So that justifies anything you want. There's no moral censure on sexual practices. So it's, it's fine art to have urination in the face of somebody else. Abortion becomes a constitutional right. And fantasize is a reasonable alternative to caring for a child who has a birth de defect. Uh, lesbian and homosexual families are normal. Drug use is a national pastime. And he goes back to Prager again. Prager says, you know, it is possible that some societies have declined as rapidly as America since the 1960s, but I'm not aware of any. And Prager has his uh, finger in the pulse of America. He's a very well-read person. And if he says we are declining faster than any society he's ever uh, looked at, that's an indictment for sure. Well, now we get, of course, a thing like this. We're so moral open-minded that we get things like, who are you to pass judgment, we ask. And uh, Kokel says at the end of the chapter, you know, if we reject truth, why should we be surprised at the moral turbulence that follows? He has a quote from Lewis, C.S. Lewis, who says, we laugh at honor and are shocked to find traitors in our midst. We castrate and bid the geldings be fruitful. He says that's the chaotic and confusing world of moral relativism. So this first chapter was just kind of looking out and seeing what's going on in society. In chapter 2, and I'd like to continue just a little bit more of this book, he talks about, you know, at one time, the moral systems that all societies had had three characteristics. First, you viewed morality as a supremely authoritative guide to action. It, it trumped how you felt as an individual. It trumped preference. It trumped self-interest. Moral questions would be some of the most important that you could ask. That was your highest priority. It was an authoritative guide for you to follow. There was the ought part of it. Uh, morality also, according to him, includes prescriptive code of conduct, not just describing it, directs how things ought to be. And there's that ought. And then third, he says, morality is seen as universal. These moral rules aren't arbitrary and personal, they're public. It's everybody everywhere. But he says, this is gone. He says, relativism rejects all universal moral rules. It abandons the idea of oughtness. It abandons it. It's gone. You don't need to do anything. Who are you to tell me what to do? Uh, says who, right? That's the, the problem. And then Kokel says, what's the difference between a relativist and a person who admits she has no morality at all? None. Really? That's quite a charge. Well, how does a moralist make a moral decision? He decides for himself whatever he thinks best. How does somebody who has no morality decide how to act? Same thing. You decide for yourself what you think is best. So here's the problem. How can you make sense of an alleged morality? Is this really a morality, but it functions the same as not having any morality at all? So he says the first reason relativism does not qualify as an ethical viewpoint is that the morality is the same as if you had no morality at all. 
He says, here's another way to, I say he again, this is still Greg Kokel talking in the second chapter. He says, another way to assess the validity of a moral system is, let's see what kind of person it produces. So look at a standard of morality. The person who is the most moral is the one who practices whatever that key moral rule is. So he gives some examples. If it's love your neighbor, then that ethic produces somebody like Mother Teresa. That's, that's a pretty good moral system. What about the practice of morality of nonviolent passive resistance? What do you get? Mahatma Gandhi. That's pretty good. What about the moral principle requiring perfect obedience to God? That's Jesus of Nazareth. So you say, you know, those are good moral systems because they produce people that, that seem good and caring. Well, what about this, though? What kind of moral champion does relativism produce? In other words, what's the best that relativism has to offer? What do you call those people who apply the principles of relativism? Now, think about these principles. They care nothing for others uh, as far as the ideas of right and wrong. They're, they're unmoved by the notions of ethical standards, and they just follow the beat of their own moral drum. Kokel says, you know, we have a name for these people. They're a homicide detective's worst nightmare. A relativist is a sociopath. That's somebody that has no conscious conscience. That's what relativism produces. So his point is relativism does not stand in some kind of great moral tradition. It's been rejected by all. He, he says, think about the great moral teachers of all time, Moses, Jesus, Paul, Buddha, Aristotle, Gandhi, Martin Luther King. They've all condemned it. If it's moral here as a sociopath and it's been opposed by every moral tradition, that's not something you want to follow. So I think I'll stop at that point. That just gives you an idea of the uh, crushing world that we're in as far as this relativism and how it's ruined so much. So this book, although it's been out for some time, you could probably find it uh, cheap someplace, it's a, it's a necessary book because we're still struggling with this. It's just got a firm grasp on American culture and American thinking, and you hear it all over the place. So please, 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 if you have a chance... Pick this one up. Easy to read, fairly short. It's uh, Beckwith and Kokel's Relativism. Well, thanks for listening, and we'll do another podcast soon.